So today's video, we're going to have a look at judicial precedent and we're going to see how it works in terms of the AQA Unit 1 specification. So let's have a look first of all at the big picture. So there are three questions on Unit 1 on judicial precedent. They are always in the same order and they are always present. The first question, which is what we're going to be focusing on mainly today, is the key features of judicial precedent. Um, this is ratio decidendi and obiter dicta, the hierarchy of the courts, and law reporting. The second question is always to do with avoiding precedent, and it can take a general stance and ask you to discuss overruling and distinguishing generally. Um, or it can ask you to look at avoiding precedent specifically, which is to do with the practice statement for the Supreme Court and Young and Bristol Aeroplanes for the Court of Appeal. And you also, the final question that you need to answer is on the evaluation of judicial precedent, which is the advantages, the disadvantages, or it could potentially be both. So what we're focusing on today is the key features of judicial precedent. And first of all, we need to go through generally what precedent is. So precedent is all to do with following previous decisions. And the judicial part means that it's to do with judges. So a judge must follow the decision of an earlier case if the material facts of that case are the same and the court making the earlier decision is a, a higher court in the hierarchy. And this can be summarised by a Latin principle called stare decisis, which literally translates to standing by your previous decision. So that's what pre precedent is. It's judges standing by the previous decisions that have been made before. So it can be uh, broken up into its individual elements. Uh, in the top right, you can see stare decisis, let the previous decision stand. And each decision is split up into two parts. You have the ratio decidendi, which is the core of the decision, the legally binding part. And this means that later judges, who are lower down in the hierarchy usually, are bound to follow it. So they're forced to follow this previous decision and they can't choose whether or not they want to. On the other hand, we have obiter dicta, which is the supporting arguments in the case. And it can sometimes referred to as the other things said in the case. This is persuasive, which means that a later judge may be persuaded to follow it, but they're not bound to do so. They can choose to follow it if they want to. So ratio decidendi in a bit more detail, the legal reason for the decision and it's what the decision is that the judge came to and why they decided in this way. And it's to do with the particular matter in hand. So I've given you the example, the ratio decidendi of a case could be because the defendant was over the age of 10, he is responsible for his crime. And as we said, it's binding, so it has to be followed. Obiter dicta, the other things said, and they're not always directly to do with what the case is about. They may be speculations as to how the case could have been decided differently. So it could be that the judge says, well, if the defendant had been under the age of 10, they would not have been responsible for the crime. But in the case that we're talking about, they were over that age. So it could be to help later judges to make decisions. And as we say, obiter dicta is persuasive, so it means it doesn't have to be followed, but it probably will. So to illustrate ratio and obiter, we need to have a look at two case examples which relate to each other. Um, in this case, the case of R and Howe and the case of R and Gotts. So to understand these cases, you need to know two pieces of information. First of all, we need to know what the defence of duress means. If you argue the defence of duress to a crime, what you're arguing is you didn't want to commit that crime, but you were forced to because you or someone you love was being threatened with violence if you didn't commit that crime. 
The other thing that you need to know, and this might sound quite obvious, um, for it to be a murder, the victim actually has to die. And for attempted murder, the victim has to live. So keep those pieces of information in mind when we are looking at the following two cases. So first of all, the case of R and How. This was a case about somebody who was actually murdered and the defendant tried to argue the defence of duress. But this had never been decided before. And the ratio, which you'll remember we said was binding, so had to be followed, was that duress is not a defence to murder. The obiter dicta, which was speculating on the outcome of a future case, was that if this had been the case about attempted murder, so the victim hadn't actually died, duress also wouldn't have been an available defence. Later on, we have the case of R and Gotts. And in this case, this was a case about somebody who attempted to murder somebody, but the victim actually lived. And this had never been the ratio of a case before. This had never come up directly in a case before. So there was no binding precedent set. So the judge looked back at the obiter dicta of old cases and was persuaded by the obiter in how. And so the obiter in how became the ratio in gods. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video and write down for yourself a definition of ratio decidendi, a definition of obiter dicta, and an overview of what happened in the cases of R and How and R and Gotts. Quite wordy and quite complicated in parts, but once you've got your head around it, you'll be absolutely fine. So pause the video here and then come back to the next section. So as we've talked about before, there are binding precedents. The ratio decidendo is a binding precedent, and this means that it has to be followed. However, there are several different types of persuasive precedent that you might need to know about. So on the left hand side, we have obiter dicta, which we said meant the other things said by a judge. And that's persuasive. So the judge doesn't have to follow it, but they can choose to. Lower courts, so a court lower down the hierarchy, also provides persuasive precedent. So the highest court in the UK is the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court may choose to look at Court of Appeal judgments, which is the court below it, if they're looking for some guidance on how to decide a case, and they can choose to follow these because they're persuasive. Similarly, courts are allowed to look at the judgments from other countries for persuasion and for guidance about how to deal with an issue. The Privy Council also has a decision-making power, which is persuasive but not binding. And dissenting judgments means courts at the top of the hierarchy, like the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, don't sit as individual judges. More often, they sit in panels of an odd number, so three, five, seven, nine. And quite often, you will have some judges on the panel who disagree with the rest of the judges. So for example, if you had five judges, if three of them decide something all in the same way, then that's the binding precedent and that's the ratio of the case. However, although the decision of the other two won't be binding, it will be persuasive. And judges do look back at these dissenting judgments, so disagreeing judgments when looking at later cases. So here's a quick review point for you to have a think about. And I'd like you on a piece of paper to summarise for me. What is the definition of stare decisis? What do you think are the three key features of judicial precedence? What do you think a law report is? How do you think law reports help drive judicial precedent? So hopefully you've had a go at those questions and I want to move on to looking at law reporting now. This is one of the key features of judicial precedent. Law reports are really important because 
the whole basis of common law is about following earlier decisions. So it's important that we have an accurate written record of what these previous decisions are. And this only became available in 1865, and this was the year that the Incorporated Council of Law Reporting was set up. So there are lots of different examples of law reports. For example, some of the most famous of the All England Law Reports and the Weekly Law Reports. And you use what is known as a case citation to find these law reports. This is the reference which contains details such as the date, the court, and the series where the law reports are written up. So you can quickly and simply identify and find the report that you're looking for. So there are fairly recent changes. In 2001, um, the High Court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court have all been given a unique citation, so you can quickly find them. Remember, those courts all deal with different types of work, so criminal and civil matters. So it's not a case of just going to one particular series. Each case is given a unique identifying number, which is not tied to any particular law report. Um, and you've got the example there of a particular citation. So 2001 EWCA CRIM 10. So we know that it's in the England and Wales Court of Appeal criminal division records. So the picture that you can see are just family law reports. And a complete set of law reports takes up 55 metres of shelf space in a library. So assuming that you are the size of about an average 17 year old, you and your friends would have to be stacked on top of each other 31 times um, to reach the top of that stack of books if they were stacked one on top of the other. So that gives you some idea of just how many books you're looking at. So cases are also now available on the internet. There are subscriptions for these websites. Um, but the subscriptions are very expensive. Some law reports are available through free websites and lawyers now have access to unreported cases and this leads to them re referring to cases more and more often. You might think having lots of information is quite helpful but Lord Diplock didn't agree. He said that the only result of lawyers referring to the transcripts was to extend the length of the hearing unnecessarily. So he very much feels that this is not a necessity. The final key feature of judicial precedent that we need to look at is the hierarchy of the courts. So in order to stand by the previous decision, we need to know whose previous decision we need to stand by. The courts need to know whose decision they have to follow and whose decision they can ignore. And in order to do this, we have the hierarchy of the courts. So this is the criminal court hierarchy, which for the AQA exam, you only need to know either the civil or the criminal side for this part of the exam. So the court at the top is the Supreme Court. They bind everyone below them and they're bound by their own previous decisions unless they use the practice statement. We'll come back to exactly what that means later on. The next court down is the Court of Appeal. They are bound by the Supreme Court and they bind everyone below them. They're also bound by their own previous decisions unless they use the rule in Young and Bristol aeroplanes. Again, we'll come back to that. Below them is the Queen's Bench Divisional Court. They're bound by the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal and they bind everyone below them. The two courts at the bottom are often referred to as the Inferior Courts, the Crown Court and the Magistrates Court. They're bound by all the courts above them, and they don't bind to any courts below. So that's an overview of the key features of judicial precedent. And the question that you could be asked in the exam is this. Outline the main features of judicial precedent. And as always, it's 10 marks, and you have 10 minutes to complete it. The suggestion would be you spend four minutes on ratio and obiter, three minutes on law reporting, and three minutes on hierarchy. What I'd like you to do now 
is have a go at writing the answer and see how well you get on. You must be able to do it in the time and you must get in as much information as possible.